the parlor on a cold winter's night. All is very cheerful, so snug and so bright. Dale looks at me, but now not with a frown. She wouldn't change with a queen and her crown. It was then I first met her, the joy of my life. She gave her throat and is now my dear wife. Her eyes always glisten when she sees the old sign. So all of you join in. Oh, I think Samuel mute. Thank you, Polly. Right, I'll start again. Can you hear me? Yeah. Mute themselves just to try and keep the for for coming. We're overwhelmed with the uh, the response to um, to the, the event this evening, and we're really really very happy to have you all here. So, um, first of all. I want to um, welcome you all to our first ever book launch. Um, it's supported and funded by the Queen Mary University London Community Connection Grants. Um, I'm Sam Johnson. I'm chair of the Match Girls Memorial, which is a charity that we set up to raise awareness of the Match Girls story and also to raise funds for, mem for memorials to honour them. Um, as some of you will know, this is a very personal journey for me, as I'm the great granddaughter of Sarah Chapman, one of the leaders of the strike. This evening has particular significance because it's on this day in 1888 that the inaugural meeting of the Union of Women Matchmakers took place at Stepney Meeting Hall in the East End, just 10 days after the Match Girls had won their victorious strike. Tonight we have a super lineup of special guests, including the poets and writers that feature in the book. But to start with, we're thrilled to welcome Roshanara Ali, MP for Bowen Bethnal Green, who will officially open our event. Well, good evening, everyone, and um, thank you so much, uh, Sam. It's a great honor to join you on this very important anniversary uh, uh, to mock and celebrate the work of the Match Girls. And uh, it's wonderful to know about and learn about your personal connection as a descendant uh, of Sarah Chapman's. And for me, it's a huge source of privilege and pride to be the Member of Parliament for Bethnal Green and Bow, the constituency within which uh, the Match Girls uh, strike uh, originated, the campaigning event originated, and uh, for the way in which, as women, they led the way in fighting for human rights, equality, and justice. And we're all uh, inspired and motivated by that legacy and heritage that started in the East End of London. And as, uh, as a child growing up in the East End of London, going to schools in Tower Hamlets, uh, and then uh, through my career and into politics, I've always talked about the powerful example that the match girls, the match women set us for our country. And in my maiden speech, when I was elected in 2010, I talked about the political heritage that is so important in, a, in, in the East End that originates from that period, from the period when they took on the Brian and May factory owners and won that battle. And the legacy of what they've left behind and what they've created is, of course, the trade union movement, the feminist movement, the labor movement, and of course, what we do today in fighting against injustices across the globe in terms of the way in which women and children are exploited and men uh, in terms of in the world of work. Uh, and I know all too well how that uh, impacts on people's lives, whether it's trafficking and forced labor or in, in terms of uh, people being trafficked into our country or forced labor in other parts of the country. 
uh, other parts of the world. For example, in Xinjiang province, uh, in the way that the Uyghur population have been enforced into uh, uh, persecuting, uh, being persecuted. Or in places like Bangladesh in 2011, the country I was born in, uh, where we have a large community in, in a stone's throw away within the borough of Tower Hamlets from the British of uh, the British Bangladeshi community, where the Rana Plaza accident claimed so many lives, over 1,100 lives, because of terrible standards, building standards, and labor standards in that country. And across the globe, we see that, that sort of persecution. These are needless. They should not be happening in this day and age. And so the significance of what the Match Girls did in our country in terms of fighting for better labor standards, protection of workers, uh, and ensuring that we have strong protections, which are often under assault, of course, uh, by certain governments, including the current government. The significance of what they did continues to be important because the assault on labor standards and rights is there in front of us within our own country and we see it elsewhere in the world in graphic terms. That's why remembering the legacy and the achievements of the Match Girls uh, and that strike that inspired a nation, not only in, the, in our own communities, but across the country is so important. And that's why what you're doing is so important. And that's why I'm so heartened by the campaign for the memorial, by the work you've been doing, by the opportunities we've had to raise uh, this very important campaign in parliament, which I will continue to do. And, and it gives, gives me great pleasure to be involved with the law tonight uh, uh, the and got some phenomenal uh, speakers uh, uh, and, and those who are going to be reading tonight uh, and I'm really looking forward to listening to everyone and I'm really delighted uh, to be able to join you all on this very important book launch and I hope that I can continue to support what you're doing in any way uh, that you feel would be helpful and beneficial to this very important campaign. I know a number of my colleagues in Parliament in the Labour Party have been very, very uh, engaged and keen to help. Lynn Brown, uh, MP for West Ham, uh, my good friend, uh, has been very involved. Uh, a number of uh, other colleagues have, men and women, but particularly the parliamentary uh, Labour MPs women's group um, were very, uh, very, very keen to hear about your work, and I will feed that back to, the, to them from today's event. Uh, you've got a massive group of female parliamentarians who are behind you with the work you're all doing. Uh, so please do let me know and I'll make sure uh, that I uh, extend um, the message to them about how else they can support you all. Thank you all very much. And once again, what a wonderful uh, uh, thing you've done in terms of both uh, the anthology, but also the campaign. Uh, uh, as I say, in the East End of London, we have such a rich tradition of campaigning, which continues. And if it wasn't for the Match Girls, then I don't believe that many of us would have been uh, able to achieve the things that we have been able to. And throughout my political career, I've been inspired by their stories, by their struggles, by what they did for the generations that have come after us. Uh, they'll always be with us. They'll always inspire us. They'll always be in our in our uh, in our minds, in our uh, working lives as women in the East End. Women who've come from the East End, wherever we go, whatever we do, whatever career paths we have chosen. Thank you. I hope that they uh, continue. I believe they will continue to inspire generations uh, that are coming behind us, uh, particularly generations of women, but also men too. Thank you. Thank you very much, Roshanara. Um, I think we're, we're now going to um, just hop over to a, uh, a short video to just give some background um, to the Match Girls story. I'm sure most of you do know it, but just in case it's a little refresher. My name is Kate Slater and I'm here to tell you my story. This is a story about dreamers 
doers, believers, ordinary people who did extraordinary things. It's a story that shows you're never too small to make a difference. I know, because I was there. I was a part of the Match Girls strike. And this is my story. My story begins in the East End of London in 1888, when Queen Victoria was on the throne. In those days, the smoke of tens of thousands of chimneys swirled across the London skyline and the city was filled with factories. One of these factories was called Brian and May Factory, and that was where I worked making matches. I was only 24 years old at the time, but I was one of the older ones. Many of the workers who worked there were between the ages of 11 and 18. There were even children as young as five or six who worked making boxes at home. The bosses liked employing children, often girls, because they were cheap and they had little hands for making things. Actually, the bosses thought they could get away with all sorts just because we were young and working class. Lots of the girls were immigrants who'd come over from Ireland because of the Great Famine. Or myself moved from Southampton to London when I was 10 because of my dad's work he got a job on the London docks anyway that made them think they could treat us appallingly just imagine it right 14 hour days fines if you did even the tiniest little thing wrong like going to the toilet or being just one minute late and don't get me started on the foreman these were the men who supervised us when we worked they were properly cruel treating us very harshly The worst thing about working at the match factory was the white phosphorus we had to work with. This was a very deadly, toxic substance. It made us girls get very sick. You get something called fossy jaw, which is when your jaw literally starts to crumble. Today, science has moved on a lot and doctors now recognise this as a form of cancer. I knew girls who died of it. It was terrifying. A death sentence. But because we were poor, we had no choice but to keep working there. Otherwise, how else would we feed ourselves and our family? I mean, it was difficult enough getting that job. We were even forced to eat our lunch at the same benches we worked at with these toxic chemicals. Can you imagine eating your sandwich off the same table you'd just been working with poisonous liquids on? But we were a tough bunch. Girls and women who could speak our minds. People think of us as poor little match girls. But we were strong. We were powerful. Together, we came and we set about organising a strike. Now, a strike is a form of protest when workers decide to stop working in order to send their bosses a signal that they disagree with them. And that's just what we did. We put down our tools and we told our bosses we wouldn't work unless they made conditions safer and stopped with all the fines. The bosses didn't like that. (laughs) Not one bit. We were supported by journalist and campaigner Annie Besant. Soon it was all over the press and in the news. Imagine that. Us. Ordinary working class girls from the East End. I'll never forget the day we walked arm in arm to the Houses of Parliament. I was wearing my best dress, my best hat, the wind in my hair as we approached Westminster Bridge. Fifty-six of us in total, all marching proud and strong. When we got there, a dozen of us were allowed inside the building's lobby. We spoke to politicians, some of the poshest, richest men in all the land. We made them listen to us, told them about the conditions at the factory and it worked, because less than two weeks later the bosses gave in. They agreed to all our demands. But our story didn't end there. We set up a union which is when workers come together to have more power against the bosses. And our strike inspired more strikes, like the Dockers' strike the next year. Yeah, it made people sit up and listen, made them think about workers' rights and women's rights. Less than 20 years later, and the suffragettes were protesting. They were fighting for votes for women. All across the country and across the world, people started to form unions, and they fought for safe, clean working conditions. Today, around the world, young people are making a difference. 
Greta Thunberg is a young environmental activist from Sweden. At age 15, she began a global school strike movement, protesting against climate breakdown. Malala Yousafzai is another young activist. Age 17, she received the Nobel Peace Prize for her work fighting for the rights of girls to be educated. So remember, you are never too small to make a difference. We turned up the heat on our employers. Our ideas spread like wildfire, burning brightly for all the world to see. But it all began with a single spark. We were the Match Girls. Thanks very much, Polly. So thank you. That, that was our um, video that was um, made by um, Polly and Louise, two of our members of the charity. And we're very, very grateful to the work that they're doing um, in the education side of, of the charity work. So um, that's just a taster of hopefully what's to come in the future. So just to um, give you a bit of background, Feathers and Pennies, the book that we're celebrating tonight, came about because we held a creative writing competition last year in partnership with Pen to Print. The entries were of such a high standard that we decided to publish this book to, ce to celebrate the, their talent and also to commemorate the Match Girls at the same time. So I'm really excited to introduce a selection of the highly commended entries in the book. And in no particular order, first of all, we have Elizabeth Miller with her poem, What More Did We Have to Lose? Elizabeth is a teacher who particularly enjoys inspiring children to develop their creative writing skills. And she's published one volume of poetry entitled Penumbra, Poems About Dementia, and is now compiling a second poetry book with the theme of childhood. Next up, after that, we'll hear from Kate Horstead and her flash fiction, Seed of Descent, is a writer of fiction who's previously been shorted for the Jero Festival of Writing and an opening chapter, chapter on Friday Night Live Awards and enjoys writing complex female protagonists. She's currently working on a historical novel set in the late Victorian London and has just discovered the joys of flash fiction. Alan Robert is a prolific creator of lyrical free verse. His poetry has been successful in competitions and featured in the UK and international anthologies and in literary magazines and on the web. He will read his poem leading up to our strike. Another flash, flash fiction comes from Ethna Cullen, Cullen with Late. She loves to write stories and poems and she was born in Dublin and then moved to London when she was just six years old. She lives with her husband in the East End of London and is unashamedly proud of her three grown up children and endeavours to embarrass them as often as she can. The last poem of this selection, Scratches, will be read by Mark Coverdale. Mark is the art school mod poet, poet founder and Tonic Star Press. He stands with poetry on the picket line. Finally, in this section, Alison Murray will read her flash fiction, which is called Fozzy Jaw. Alison describes herself, amongst other things, as a Londoner with Irish roots and a passion for women's history. Thank you, Elizabeth. What more did we have to lose? Day after weary grinding day, as match girls, we inhaled the poisoned air of yellow phosphorus, even breathed it as we chewed our bread, until our flowery faces faded into smudges, blurred through long exposure. These hideous doughy lumps emerged around our chins with a pain so fierce that we were willing to concede our teeth and surrender to the surgeon's saw, the spongy putrid jaw, which to glow through hovel sacking in the midnight gloom. What more did we have to lose? Any beauty long before lamented disposable as Lucifer's, and our meagre pay already docked for speaking out of turn, for grubby feet. Some even lost their reason. One girl, sweet Ellen, told us how she saw clear visions in her seizures. 
of a bright tomorrow, emerald fields of sunshine, flowers dancing, laughter, and a proper meal. When we match girls chose to strike, what more did we have to lose? Kate, if you'd like to start, thank you. Sorry, I just um, technical hitch. Seed of seed of descent. The girls exit the factory gates. Adolescent bodies twisted, heads down, eyes glancing over shoulders. They are used to being watched, pounced on for any misstep, like speaking. How will I get them to talk? Most are about the age Mabel was when she still lived with me. A low murmur like a church congregation carries across the courtyard. I notice too with protruding jaws, faces and futures ruined. Spilling into the street, one voice rises above the rest. Then he told her to mind the machine, not her fingers. The other girls giggle then gasp. Excuse me. She turns her curly head, her gaze direct. Can you spare a minute? Why should I? Her green eyes spark defiance, just like Mabel's. They thought taking her away would crush her spirits. Judging by her letters, it has only rallied them. I want to know how you find working here. I hold out my hand. Annie Besant. As long as I ain't gonna get in trouble. She has heard of me. I can't promise you that, but I want to help. She looks at the factory, then back at me. All right. She takes my hand, grips it. Alice, Alice Francis. Thank you very much. Uh, Alan, I think you're next. Well, I think, Alan, you might be on mute. Um, I think you might need to unmute yourself, Alan. I'm not sure if you can hear me. We can't hear you, Alan. Oh, sorry about that. Thank you. Hi, I'm Alan Robert. Like so many of the match girls of Irish heritage, that drove me to create leading up to our strike. Here from Cork with me, folks, but out to work, East End of the Smoke. Factory job, very little pay, very long hours, may not complain. Match production, thousands a day. Poplar sticks secured in frames. Sulfur dipping, brimstone bathing, ingesting fumes on the line. Blinding headaches, rubbing teeth, dizzy head, coughing, wheezing. Feet unsteady, must have flu. Got much worse, week by week. No sick days, would lose pay. Not it was very much, but help defray household costs on the bread line in the squalor. Teeth fell out, abscess pain, swelling gums, jaw disease. Going on strike, better conditions, need to win. I pray we will. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. Ethnic, you're next. Late. The foreman was in a bad mood. I suppose the bosses had been giving him a hard time, so he took it out on us. It was his way. They came in late, the two girls from Allgate, Irish girls. They always stuck together. 
He flew at them, cursing and making a dreadful noise. They'd be for it, fines taken out of their wages, as if our pay wasn't bad enough already. A carriage had overturned on the road and they'd not been allowed to cross till it was righted. That's what kept them. He didn't care, miserable old so-and-so. We all looked away not to shame them, but Cassie Brown looked hard at them. We'd all learned to read lips. It's so loud on the factory floor. She was saying, serves them right. And a comment about the Irish, she shouldn't have. A ripple of excitement went through the factory. We knew they'd seen and there'd be a fight down the road, away from the foreman's view. We'd form a circle and watch, watch Cassie pay for her rudeness in a bare knuckle fight. Somehow, the shift seemed to go a little faster after that. Thanks very much. As you now, Mark. Oh, it's a poem called Scratches. These given takers, us taken givers, us nithering arms with shift alarms from shafters fruitless flee. These frame the smog with hat and rod and want us criminal be. These corn cross dish to comfort mug, us mafficking sods in capital fog, us Monday mice smoggy cogs of ditch and chapel, duff and scratching toil. These dainty doyles of telegraph fat, shave nape and plum, curtsy spend their surname spoils. These divi division suitors, ledger scratch with gimlet eye, toast peaks in troughs with foul dispatches of us, crumb condemned to exhaust and quell in standard daily rackets. Us, sallow grudge and sorrow trudge, but us throng know where the meat is from. Us dandelion nippers, burden sellers of common blend will smirk our end in her pride's eye, in suffer shirts, till wooded jackets with save stitch bright united letters and forth us stride in strife in strike. For we are only ever betters. Thank you. Thanks very much, Mark. Cassie Jaw. My kin came from Ireland when the Blight took the food and the English their homes. We live in Sophia Street in Poplar. There are so many of us from back home living here and in Rook Street that it's like we never left. We tell stories of home and sing the songs of home. We don't have much. The houses are tired and drafty and with a new baby coming every year as cramped as can be but we stick together, that's what Fenians do. When I was 12, I left school and went to work in the match factory with my mother. Well, really, I took her place. She was on baby number nine, I think, our numbers go up and down. I started at the factory, and Jesus, what a place. It smelled awful, and piles of glowing green vomit lined the streets outside. What the hell is that? I asked an older woman, a friend of my mother. That's the girls with the fossy jaw, she told me. I went home to my mother and I asked her about the fossy jaw. Now don't be making nuisance of yourself, Maggie, she said. We need to eat. Thanks very much. I mean, that was a really wonderful selection um, from the book and really, really enjoyed those readings. It really brings the, the poems and the stories to life. So thank you so much for that. So now we're actually going to move on to, um, to a bit of music. Um, we're delighted to introduce uh, Rael, who's um, a young up and coming musician. And I think I'm going to hand over to her to give her, I know, her own little bit of instruction to her first piece of music. Well, the first song that you guys will be hearing is called Dead in Grey. Um, Dead in Grey is a song that, well, I have a specific meaning for it, but I love the way that my music can be taken by anyone. So 
in a way, I would love if I could find out what your thoughts are on it, meaning what you can understand through the songs and the lyrics. Um, I really like to bring my music and poetry together. So it doesn't really have a direct meaning, but I hope you guys enjoy it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Royal. That was um, very, very moving. I mean, if anybody ha does have any ideas um, of, of what, what um, Royal meant in her song, then please do pop them in the chat and um, I'm sure she'd be very happy to do, engage with you on that. Uh, so, so next we're actually going to move on to um, a ne the next section, the last section of um, our poets um, and writers. And these are actually the, um, the winners of the competition last year. So first of all, we have the two runners up. Um, we have Debbie Rolls, who will read her flash fiction Saturday night. Debbie's a teacher and educator, a freelance writer and trade unionist. She recently completed a creative writing MA in travel and nature at Bath Spa University, 
and is working on a variety of writing projects for children and adults. Today is also Debbie's birthday, so many happy returns of the day to you, Debbie. The other runner-up is in our poetry category, which is Emma Pursehouse with Match Girls at Whitson, 1888. Emma is currently the Poet Laureate of the City of Wolverhampton. She writes for both children and adults. And I think it would be great if we could hear those two runners up first and then we'll end with the winners. Um, so Debbie, if you could uh, if you could take it away, that'd be great. Saturday night, we put on our armour on a Saturday night, dress pressed as well as can be, sponged down and then placed between bedstead and mattress. Boots blackened with soot, so the scuff marks won't show. But it's our heads that make other heads turn. The heavy earrings that sway when we walk. Hats make a statement. Feathers floating above us in all colours of the rainbow. The dockers might unload goods from faraway places, but we let them know there is nothing more exotic in the East End than us nor anyone more determined. We're not looking for whistles, a glass of gin, or good looking boys. We are here to find support, to tell our story. Tonight, we're speaking to the Trades Council, listing the reasons why we had to strike, how Bryant and May find us, made work dangerous, refused to listen to our grievances, when Annie Besant exposed their exploitation, they tried to scare us into submission. Now, we speak for ourselves. Saturday night means solidarity, collecting our strike pay together, explaining the justice of our cause to others. Match girls will dance again on a Saturday night. Today, we are dressed for battle. Thanks very much, Debbie. Match girls at Whitson, 1888. They clatter out of the paragon, fringed, feathered, foul-mouthed, singing at voice tops, filling the air with sparking exuberance, arm in arm, a battalion in beer. Cheeking the chaps that cackle verbsides offering to them. Mary pulls up with laughter so hard she says it makes her teeth ache. At each alleyway and street corner they turn another girl loose until only two are left to say goodnight. Maggie becomes a song disappearing into darkness. Sarah at the lodging door, hopes Mrs. Mimi has glued herself to sleep amongst finished boxes stacked high on the table. Hopes she isn't waiting up with a, what time do you call this? A, you'll catch it when they lock you out for half a day. A whispered baggage. Fossy jaw set to chew so hard at Sarah, she has to look away. Hopes there'll be no out on your ear if you don't make the rent to follow her up the wooden hill to a damp bed shared with a killed mood, to work rosary beads through her fingers, pray for change, wake in the night with a start, to see her work things glowing away on the chair, like an omen or a visitation. Thanks very much, Emma. So finally, it's with great pleasure that you'll hear the two winners, Emma Pursehouse again, well done Emma, with her flash fiction, Painters, and Eleanor Walsh with her poem, Strike Anywhere. Emma's most recent poetry collection is Close, Offers Press, and her first novel, novel Dogged, from Ignite Books, was published early in 2021. Emma has performed, performed her work at spoken word nights and festivals across the UK. Eleanor is a PhD graduate from the University of Plymouth. She now lives in Cornwall, where she works as an English tutor and creative editor. Her novellas, Birds with Horse Hearts in the Pole and Stormbread, set in Cornwall, are available from ad hoc fiction. So the floor is yours again, Deb, uh, Emma.
um, painters. She stops by the bench, a dog yapping at bowl churchyard pigeons. She glances at my Tesco Express name badge. Lunch I'll read, she asks. I wave my book at her. Yep. You into art? I give up. Yeah. You. Me? She's distracted by council workers arriving. Maybe. A little. What? You draw? More of a painter. What kind of things? Hands, mostly. Difficult things, hands. She looks at me then, sharp eyes staring straight into mine. You an artist? God no, unless you count arrangement of product onto shelves. Oi! She makes a sudden beeline for the workers. Leave it! The workers ignore her. Clean stains from a statue's upturned palm. She looks shaken. Let me buy you a coffee, I say, from across the way. I'll return. Find her sitting on my bench, dog snuffling at her veined hands. I perch beside her, and out it pours, a tumbled, jumbled lunch hour history lesson. Now, then, blood on hands, slaves, match girls, coffee beans, zero hours, sweatshops, remembrance. That night, she foots the ladder. I redouble Gladstone's hands, match head red. As I attempt to return her paint, she refuses it, pats my hand. Yours now, dear, she says. Thanks very much, Emma, and congratulations. Uh, sorry, Emma, and now Eleanor, thank you. Strike anywhere. At the bench again, match fingers working from memory. You're reliving last night's ostrich feathers, the color of sky that hangs over the factory's high ceiling, glue and dust growing now like an extra skin. Pretty, weren't you? In the music hall, everyone said so. The double-ended lucifers in your fist require only friction, not along the red edge of the box, but anything at all. And you think of this when the other girl has sixpence swiped for a tray that topples from her hands. Only friction. A bright fissure through the air that sounds like breaking before the flame finds its way. And you made it yourself, didn't you? Admit it, you're becoming ostrich egg. Bulge under the jaw and tooth cracking sound, pushing scared fingers into your throat where it swells. You're heavy enough to drown, growing new bones. You were incubating, pipping, breaking up when you bite down. But last night alone, you sang the words at the ceiling after the show and thought of the ostrich feathers that moved on the dance floor as if they could take flight. The blue of the great outdoors. With matches breaking in your wet fist before raining down, you hear the same old music play now as you push through. Through this cruel eggshell, a flames fissure through the air that sounds like breaking. They're scavenging pennies from you, but you're suddenly starving and sobered up, walled up and matchbox small, like a fist for the fight. Thanks very much. And thank you once again to, F well, all of the entrants. I know there's many of you in the in the audience tonight um, and also for the for the readers tonight. I mean, it's just been a fantastic experience actually being involved in the whole the whole thing from the beginning of the competition right through to tonight where we can launch the book. And I think, it, you know, I just can't thank you all enough for your um, for your input. So thank you very much for that. Um, also, you may be interested to know that um, there's a, a podcast on um, called Union Jews. Um, I can put a link in the in the chat in a moment, which actually, so a chap called Simon Sapper does, uh, makes podcasts and he's made one especially to, to commemorate um, this event, the, the book launch, and to also talk about uh, the, um, the Match Girls. So he's, he's interviewed a few of us from the charity and also the, uh, the winners of, of this competition have also read for him. So I'll put the, the link in the chat, but that's, I think it first airs at 8 a.m. tomorrow, um, but then you can just go to the website anytime and listen to it. So de definitely recommend having a listen to that. So now we're back to some more music with uh, Rael and I'll pass back to her so she can interview, her, uh, in, sorry, introduce her own piece.
think we might have um, actually lost her. So I'll, I'll just go straight to her video. I don't know if her connection's dropped. Okay, that's uh, fine. But I think this is this is her piece that she wrote, um, you know, especially about the Match Girls. So it's called Be Heard. From um, you Earth, and I wrote a song today called Be Heard for the Match Girls Foundation. You can even see me, you can even hear me I don't know why I try You can even see me, you can even hear me You should see the way I cry Tell me why I have to watch a society silence So many people Great. So th thanks very much to Rael, even though I think we, we may have lost her, but um, thank, thank you very much for those um, inspiring pieces of music. Um, and we wish you, wish you well in your, in your career as it progresses. So we now move on to the, the final phase of the evening with a panel discussion and a question and answer session at the end. We have a terrific lineup kicking off with a scene setter for the discussion by artist and activist Terry Bell Halliwell. Terry runs invisiblewomen.org.uk, which is a catalyst for gender equality in civic statues in the UK. We'll then hear from Ed Legon, who, who will chair the discussion and Q&A afterwards. Ed is a lecturer in heritage management at Queen Mary University of London. He co-runs the MA in heritage management and a, coll a collaboration between QMUL and the historic Royal Palaces. He is a historian with research interests in memory, heritage and radicalism, including in the East End. So I'll hand over to Ed now and I'll see you all again at the end. Thank you. Thanks very much indeed, Sam. Are we going to um, have from Terry before I yeah. introduce? Hi. You've probably That's noticed it. the great upsurge of interest in civic statues over the last year or so. TV news has shown us 
pictures of figures from the past being brought down by angry crowds and removed by anxious authorities. From being a quiet presence in the background almost overlooked, they'd become a hot topic. This has arisen out of a sea change in perceptions. The portrayal of women has come into much sharper focus since the Time's Up and Me Too movements. Likewise, the representation of black and ethnic minority people after the Black Lives Matter movement. Questions of, about the gross under or misrepresentation of these two major groups of people has brought in its wake wider questions about all minorities, questions about the lack of real representation of diversity, class, ethnicity, gender and orientation are all in the mix. Most civilizations over the centuries have erected statues, and the widespread, long-lasting nature of this practice tells us it's worth something, that it does have an effect, it has a power, the quiet, persistent power of the civic statue. You could call them the original influencers. I think the best interpretation of the motivation to erect statues would be that the practice arises from a wish to place a marker in the flow of history to honour some brave, kind, generous, clever, beneficial action in order that future generations might learn what's of real and lasting value to society. And whilst it's true of a certain proportion of memorials, it's also true that very many, historically, almost certainly the majority, are self-serving, self-aggrandising effigies to bolster the power and interests of the regal, political, cultural and class elites. These old patriarchal attitudes have resulted in a nation full of eschatities of kings, soldiers, prelates, professors, almost entirely male. The best estimate made by Caroline Criado Perez in 2016 from the statistics that were available then was that, excluding royals, about 85% of UK civic statues were men and women had been relegated to the also rams. Roughly 15% of statues were female and of that paltry 15%, 12%, were angels, nymphs, anonymous, saintly, sexualized, not women uh, honoured for what they'd done, just designed to be titillating and to remind women of their chief functions as seen from the traditional limited male point of view. That left only around 3% of real named women who'd been honoured for their achievements. That's 3% to represent 50% of the population. Happily, since 2016, there's been real progress in the public debate about the value of civic statues, about the number and nature of statues to women, with ongoing vigorous campaigns for more. Now the two leading arts organisations in the UK, the Public Sculptures and Statues Association and Art UK, both have dedicated sections of statues for women. Working from their figures, the current best estimates are that about 80 statues of, women's were of women were erected between 1882 and 2016. That's about half a statue a year. Since 2016, there have been 30 statues of women erected. That's six statues a year. Roughly a tenfold increase in the rate of appreciation of all that women have contributed to our world. This new scrutiny of the old status quo has resulted finally in the realisation that there have been countless women, not a paltry 3%, whose achievements are truly worth celebrating. Women who have done those brave, kind, generous, clever and beneficial things for society. Their statues really are markers in the flow of history, honouring the great women of the past to inspire the great women of the future. Well, thank you very much indeed, uh, Terry, for that very important uh, history of public memorials in the UK. Um, and that's going to be a rather difficult act to follow, I think. Um, it's been a really wonderful occasion and to hear uh, the talks and the poems has been very inspiring. Uh, I now have the honour of chairing a special panel discussion uh, with which we will conclude this evening. I'll introduce our four speakers shortly. Before I do so, I've been invited to provide some brief thoughts about the Match Girls Memorial campaign and in response to Terry's video as well. Uh, from Queen Mary, uh, where I'm a lecturer, I've observed the Match Girls Memorial campaign with keen interest, uh, interest which has burned all the brighter as students have chosen the proposed memorial as a topic of research 
including, I must add, one of the organisers of this event, Anna Somner. As students have shown, the efforts of the Match Girls Memorial campaigners and the authors of the, uh, the book, uh, which we celebrate together today, are not simply uh, acts of commemoration. These are radical acts. Terry and the wider Match Girls Memorial campaign inform us of the paltry and woeful representation of women by UK memorials and the sexualization and trivialization of those few women who have been represented. In the UK, public commemoration has been in thrall of the stories with which for centuries its rulers have often been beguiled. And the Match Girls strike, perhaps one of the most influential episodes of industrial action in the UK, and at that, one driven by women, for women, sits uncomfortably within the hitherto dominant mode of British memorialization. Because of this, the importance of the Match Girls Memorial Campaign surely exceeds commemoration of the explosive events of the summer of 1888. The history of protest and radicalism in East London speaks of experiences of difference from the dominant culture. Alterity uh, is a word that's sometimes used. This experience has been common to women, workers, and generations of Flemish, French, Jewish, and Bengali immigrants, amongst others, in East London. Tower Hamlets takes its name from the archipelago of Hamlet, which extended eastwards along the Thames from the eastern walls of the medieval city, which grew exponentially following immigration in the late 16th and 17th centuries. Tower Hamlets was outside, and its inhabitants have often been labelled outsiders, nonconformists, if you will, often literally in terms of religion. As early as 1684, which is my um, kind of research period, a pamphlet complained that the area's residents were generally very factious and poor. Perhaps the author of these words recalled the hundreds of men and women who assembled at Mile End Green in 1647 to show their support for the levellers' radical political and social agenda, those which another pamphlet called the rogues of Mile End Green. And so memorials, like one to the Match Girls, are of immense value in rescuing the poor from their contemporaries' condescension as factious rogues, but also, as the historian E.P. Thompson famously put it, the condescension of posterity as well. A memorial to the Match Girls of 1888 is clearly a memorial to much more besides. It is a rescue mission for the marginalised of our history and the marginalised of our society too. But that's quite enough from me. I would like to introduce our four esteemed panellists today. Uh, Dr. Halima Begum, Laura Daly, Zita Holborn and Mona Mathuru. Dr. Halima Begum is Chief Executive of the Running Me Trust, the UK's leading race equality think tank. Halima is a lifelong campaigner for equality and civil rights and was inspired by the Match Girls struggle from a young age, having been educated a few hundred yards from the site of the Bryant and May factory in Bow. Halima has worked tirelessly to achieve equality for minority groups since her teens, co-founding Women Against Racism and holding leadership positions within the UK government's Department for International Development and the British Council. Laura Daly is an activist and founder of the Women's Banner Group, which was founded in 2017 to recognise the overlooked achievements of women from coal mining history. Laura's work led to the creation of the first All Women Banner Group to be affiliated to the Durham Miners Association. Since then, Laura and the group have been involved in a series of national campaigns and they've developed an education workshop entitled Let Them Be Heard to encourage young people to value debate and their voices within it. Zita Holborn is an award-winning human rights campaigner, a community and trade union activist, international speaker, and multidisciplinary artist. She is co-founder and national chair of Barrack UK, national vice president of PCS Union, and national co-chair of Artists Union England. She's also a visual artist, curator, author, poet, writer, and vocalist. Her roles include membership of the UNESCO Coalition of Artists for the General History of Africa. Zita has authored a book and won a Lifetime Achievement Award for a Quality Champion and National Diversity Awards Positive Role Model for Race, sorry. Like the Match Girls, Zita is featured in the exhibition Women Activists of East London. And last but not least, uh, Mona Matharu is a researcher who focuses on how people remember, interpret and value the past. She recently completed an MA in Curation, Collections and Heritage, in which she invested investigated the meaning of memorial spaces, the authority of memory, expressions of silence and trauma, and the impact of colonialism on record keeping. Mona's particular focus has been diaspora and 
conservation culture, with particular attention being given to Punjab memorial spaces, uh, which has included field, field work in the UK and elsewhere. Mona is also project archivist for the wonderful Tower Hamlets Local History Library and Archive. So I'm going to get the ball rolling by asking a question, which is for anyone on the panel who wishes to answer it. So please do uh, come forward with an answer. Uh, clearly, a great many worthy causes are represented on this panel, anti-racism, human rights, ethnic migration, championing forgotten histories. But what draws each of you personally to the story of the Match Girls? How have stories such as theirs inspired your own activism? And this is where everybody's far too kind to speak first. <laughs> so I'll go if that's okay. <laughs> Um, I, I guess for me that the Match Girls, I, I'm a trade unionist, so um, it's hard to ignore the Match Girls story. It is, for me, the beginning of trade unionism. Um, but really what it is, it, it is proof that women, when they organise and collectivise, can achieve unbelievable things. Um, and the fact that even, even, I mean, obviously everybody here tonight will know everything about the Match Girls, you know, I, it's just an incredible story. But um, in in education and in, in wide society, a lot of people might know a great deal about it. And I think a lot of that... So for me, um, having the opportunity to see the difference in black and white that women can make when they get together and when they argue for better rights for women, how that can then um, move out for better rights for everybody was something that really spoke to me. Um, and, and especially even, you know, in this day and age, we're still fighting for equality. We're still fighting for the right for women to be heard. Um, in the trade union movement as, as well, I think um, this story has to be one that is championed. It has to be one that we learn lessons from, and it has to be one that is, um, it, it takes the place of a role model for all of us, not just women, but everybody, because it was absolutely fantastic and must have been terrifying for them. You know, listening to those poems earlier on, the link between this thing that is a story that people have heard and actually the the reality of what that must have been like came through so well in, in those poems and it was really emotional and I think it's reminding people this isn't a story this actually happened and actually they achieved this so can you and I guess that's the inspiration that I take from it. Really wonderful Laura thanks very much indeed for your answer there um, I should say that uh, please do put questions in the chat if you would like to because I believe that there will be a little bit of time um, towards the end of the session to open it up to the floor um, but Zita Halima Mona uh, would yeah. you like to jump I would say um, first of all actually thank you very much for inviting me to be on this panel it's a, an honour to be here um, and thank you for the inspirational contributions so far um, I would say um, it's their courage because when you think about the time they were in and who they were as poor working class women who actually didn't have power, um, faced an even more patriarchal society than the one we live in now, because it hasn't gone away, to have the courage to do what they did before there were organized trade unions and structures and support systems, um, you know, that I've been on strike many times. Um, but, you know, I have the support of established trade union movement um, and um, laws that protect me when I do go out on strike and regulations and processes and so on. And to do what they did um, in that time when they didn't have power, but actually collectively they came together and it wasn't just a small number of women. That was a huge number of people that come in together. Um, and that they took that power and um, they, um, you know, acted on self collective self-determination um, to stand up for their rights. They were brave, they were courageous. And I think that that's something that stayed um, with me, you know, in all the years I've been involved in the trade union movement. I give talks on the history of trade unions and the history of women and black people in trade unions. And I will always talk about 
um, the, the match girls and what they achieved. And effectively, we stand on their shoulders today. Fantastic. Thank you, Zita. I very much get the feeling from your answer and Laura's as well that the, the history of protests is uh, campaigning of all varieties is very much one of, of being inspired by previous generations. So that's really interesting. Thank you. Uh, Halima or Mono, would you like to chip in? Uh, I'll chime in. Um, I think, yeah, as Laura and Zita said, one person, thank you so much for having me. Um, I think the fact that this isn't history, the fact that yes, it, it still persists. And I think the thing that struck a chord with me is the fact that there was an initial public humiliation to the whole, in the press, to the whole campaign. And I think the fact that they had defiance and persistence to keep pushing against that. And if we look in our globalized, modernizing world, it's, it's you know, it's, it's difficult, especially, you know, under our pandemic to, to kind of re-engage re ourselves. And if you look at things like with BLM and the Hong Kong protests and how they were able to use social media to kind of, you know, share tactics. And then you can also have that up against like smear campaigns within the press. When you look at this, this protest and how they kind of pushed against the press and then you've got this spark of public outrage and sympathy for it, I think is, is just one of the most powerful, like powerful moments. And it's, it's this defiance against rejection, which I think is really commendable. And, and the fact that you know, we aren't looking at history, we are, we are looking at the fact that this still exists. And, you know, particularly in other countries, as uh, Roshnan, Roshna said earlier about um, how we have rights uh, problems outside of the UK. Very much indeed, Mona, fantastic answer. And Elima? Yeah, no, thank you. And just, just to say, oh my God, what um, a joy it was to listen to the creative content and the singing and the poetry, because what that reminded me of was why the match girl strike was so important to me. It was a very personal one, actually. So I went to school in Central Foundation Girls School in Bow. Now, at the time, um, it was quite unusual to be in school learning about a working class strike. I mean, I now find out 25 or 30 odd years later, well, that's abnormal because we're not taught the history of working class uh, fight back and communities, never mind the history of uh, working class girls and women in the East End. But because I went to school in East London, it was just that kind of thing that a very progressive teacher did. Like she felt it was important to um, make us aware of that. So there was a very personal element to it. And that's what I remember. And when I heard the poetry, it's that kind of personal narrative that shone across. And it was also quite powerful, Ed, because what was powerful about the Match Girl Strike was that their voices as people suffering and having their own experiences heard and listened to as lived experience matters. Because so often you hear about protests from a secondary and a third source. Very rarely do you hear that authentic voice for people who are working class. We didn't learn their craft by the way but going to university and seeing, but because they had to fight and learn their craft and their fight while they were in struggle. And that's why the girl strike and other strikes are so important because it teaches you the value of organizing and fighting back for your rights when you have so little. Um, to that point about what more did we have to lose? Well, if you've got nothing more to lose, but you can show that courage, it leaves us inspired, right? Like we can do so much more when, when in fact we have so much more to begin with. But these uh, young women who at a time, as Zita was saying, I mean, it was exploitative, dangerous, risky, all of that. So I feel quite inspired. I feel quite personally connected. And I feel as though there's something about the East End um, that generates that level of activism that can inspire national movements, global movements, and um, how proud I feel to be connected to the East End and that heritage and that story. Fantastic stuff. Thank you very much indeed. Um, I have another uh, question which I'm going to ask to everyone again, and I'm sorry I'm sort of allergic to picking on people, as Anna Somner will know, so I just <laughs> have to get you to pile in with your answers. Um, Terry earlier referred to statues as being the original influencers, I think. Uh, do you think a statue of Match Girls would have the power to inspire today's and future generations? And perhaps this is an opportunity to meditate more generally on the 
situation with uh, statues in the UK. So please feel free to uh, come forward with any answers to that. Um, yeah, I'll go. Um, I think statues, it's quite interesting, isn't it? Because the debate that we've been statue um, and, um, you know, glorifying um, people who discriminated, um, who enslaved people and profited from them. You know, there's a big debate about statues, but when we look at what, what are the statues that, that we see around us, uh, you know, in our city centres, um, it's predominantly men, yeah, that um, are, are, are there. And actually, there's no narrative to those stories. Lots of people are walking around, not even knowing the history, of the, the, those men in those statues. Um, so I think that, you know, I'm a visual artist. You can see some of my paintings behind me. So I use arts to campaign for equality, freedom, justice, and human rights. So I think that's extremely important. So, you know, I think statues are a fantastic um, uh, idea to um, memorialize the um, match girls. Um, but I think that there also needs to be resources and the narrative about what they achieved and not just the statues standing alone. I think you need a whole education package that goes with it so that people know who they are, what they did, what they achieved, and why that's relevant and important to our story today, why it's relevant to the spot that they are placed in um, when that happens. But yes, I think um, we need more women. We need more um, black and brown people uh it, it represented in statues um and um you know there is the, uh, there is um a debate to be had still about the statues that exist that shouldn't be up in my view and what happens to them and i created a piece of art last year when all of that discussion was going on and um of course the stat statue was toppled um which was um uh, uh showing the museum of racist statues um, with a lock key and locked indefinitely. So that would be where I'd like to see those statues go to and we can replace them with lots of women and black and brown people. And I think, you know, not just historic figures, but living legends as well is important. It's really important actually for people to see somebody that looks like you, that is in a statue, that's in a piece of art, that's living today, because that's also an inspiration, not just the historical women, um, but the women that are living today and fighting for our rights today. It shouldn't just be when we're dead that we're recognised. Yeah, thank you, Ziz. Does anyone else like to come in? Yeah, can I just question something? Well, not question. I would, I would argue um, in the introduction there, Ed, you said that um, the statues that we currently have are um, or the original influencers. Actually, more often than not, they were just people who had a lot of money who could afford to get statues of themselves put up and so tended to be people you wouldn't really want to celebrate, um, but people just who had the money to do it. And I don't think we've really come that far in society that, you know, recognises um, it, it's a class, class issue as much as a gender based issue. And, you know, it's intersectional with, you know, uh, uh, you know, stand in complete solidarity with everything that Zita said about you know um, we need to represent all of our diversity in statues because representation absolutely matters. I think though you know a matchstick girls statue just to answer your question absolutely would help it really would help um, because I think um, you know having that that visual representation there will start a conversation it, it won't work just on its own. We need to have the education behind it. We need to have something where people can talk to each other about it. I know in schools at the moment, I work very closely. I'm, I'm, you know, I, I work for um, an education union. Um, you're not allowed to talk about anything that would ever question capitalism. That's written in black and white in our law now. So trade unionism, um, socialism, anything like that, that, that might question capitalism, it's not allowed to be talked about. So we need to create spaces where those conversations can be had, especially with our young people who are going, you know, we've talked a lot today about carrying on and standing on the shoulders of other people. 
that's what we need to be doing so yes a statue would be amazing it, I'd love to see it up it would be fantastic but it does need to go hand in hand with other things as well Brilliant. Thanks very much for that important intervention, Laura. Halima, you've got your hand up. Yeah, I, I still behave like I'm in a classroom. Um, yeah, no, I, I want to say, of course, of course, but it's the minimum, isn't it, a statue? Because what do you get with an iconic statue, this piece of an infrastructure? It has to come with something of an education and learning process, like going back to school where actually I learned something about the movement. So then you can connect that empathy piece to a public statue that you then see and you are then able to tell and imagine a story behind what that statue is, because without that story and that narrative and that education piece, it just becomes posturing in many ways. And you start entering into a discussion about whose other statues matter. What matters is whose stories are being made invisible, whose stories are written out. But stories themselves can't just be written and seen from a statue. They have to be written out in the national curriculum. And that's why the whole discussion about statues for me is just a touch too superficial. It's, it's emblemic of what, what needs to happen, don't get me wrong. But if we only talked about statues, we're going to miss that other piece, which is around how young people learn about heroes and heroines that came from... Um, yesteryears and why did they do what they did and um, the story behind the match girls um to me is is around um, migrants actually flexible workforce um, migrants who were uh, irish who suffered a lot of racism and discrimination and the personal and the relevant connection there must be for all of us the east end as we see today i'm a british bangladeshi i also work in an organization that uh, works on anti-racism well, here's your connection to the Match Girls, isn't it? I mean, it's literally a story and a strike about being a migrant and gender and class intersecting in a context where power sat somewhere else. Well, I could tell you that story again happening right now in 2021. That's a process that we want to see retold, not just the statue. I fear if we only talked about statues, you get sucked into a culture war. Let's not do that. This is much more than a conversation about statues. This is about honoring the voices and the uh, empathy and the emotions that I heard in those poems. That's much more than the statues, but it's, it's necessary, um, but not enough maybe. So not to take away from the need to have the statue, but do more with it. Can I slightly debate you there, Halima? Um, so I, 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 do, I do agree with a lot of what you say, but I do think that as much as it could be seen as superfood, there are, there, are, there are moments with it. Like when I saw the chat tree, which is in Brighton, and it's a memorial that uh, is representative of Sikh soldiers and Hindu soldiers in the World War. I saw this as a mid twenties young woman and you know, being educated in the British education, education system, I went to Flanders Field and I saw, we saw so many names on World War memorials that it took for me to get to my mid twenties during university to find and see names of Sikh and Hindu soldiers in a memorial. And I had a very visceral reaction to that. And even with my work in Tower Hamlets, like I see names like Ali and Mohammed and seeing these names make me choke up. And I can imagine seeing the kids that are in the, the schools in Tower Hamlets that work with these archives, just seeing their name in history. And I, as much as I do agree, it shouldn't just be at this level that we break the statue. I don't think we should also underplay the fact that seeing this, I, I can imagine a young girl seeing this and having that question of, of who are they? because we're so used to seeing, you know, very boastful, you know, uniformed men on horses that do, would we, isn't it something that's gonna be very juxtaposed to what we're normally, we, we're so used to seeing, you know? That, that's, yeah. Well, and I, I think we're so drawing again on that. No, go on. Well, I, I was just gonna say, I don't think we're disagreeing. Um, I'd no, rather no. you were choked when you were 20 to see that, but that actually when you were, and I was five or six or seven years old, we learned something about that. So when we then saw the statue that represented the match girls, we could like, you know, like really absorb that what that means. So what you need is a win-win and more, more and adding more than the statues. My fear Definitely. with the statues is that it's seen as a lightning rod for another conversation, not the conversation that we want to further, which is what you just spoke about. Yeah. 
And I, de and I definitely agree with also drawing on what Laura said about this, how do we see heroism tree and, and what does a statue really, when we're, when we're looking at the fact that we're putting something up to just kind of have it align with what's already there. I definitely agree with that. I definitely think that we need to have varied forms of cultural memory and it shouldn't just be in aesthetic values. Thank you, Mona and Halima. Uh, Zita and Laura, I don't know whether you want to come in on that or whether to move in, to move on at this point. Go ahead, I mean, Laura. I, I, it, it, it's interesting as well because um, normally in the conversations that I have um, within, you know, the trade union movement and the political movement, I'm um, the only woman in the room. <laughs> and so in this room, I feel, you know, the imposter syndrome's kicked in massively tonight. Everybody on this panel is just so incredible. Um, and I just, yeah, I, I think, to be honest, I think we're all kind of on the same page on this one. Um, it is, you know, yay, statues, but also can we have other stuff as well? Let's, you know, just to boil it down to its bare minimum. <laughs> Uh, one one quick thing, because I know you have to move on to some other questions, is I would say that we have to think carefully. If there were, if there is going to be a statue and it happens, actually we should be thinking about who's commissioned to produce that that statue. Um, we should be thinking of artists who are marginalised. We should be thinking of women um, uh, um, artists. We should be thinking about East End artists, migrant artists people who reflect the community and reflect what the match girls um, stood for and what they achieved. So I think that often when we what we see with art commissions is that actually it goes to white, straight, middle class men. And so they're the ones that are profiting. And I do, do think we need to look at that as well. Um, you know, often I've, I've, I've had to campaign to fund statues um, for example, I, I co-led a campaign to keep Mary Seacole on the curriculum, but also campaigned, you know, for uh, and helped to fundraise for the statue that we now have of Mary Seacole. We shouldn't have to actually go through a fight and, you know, fight for resources and money um, even to get statues up in the first place of people that reflect us and reflect our times and our histories. Yes, and back to what I said, get rid of all of those white men yeah that profited from slavery etc um and let those statues move over so for some more interesting ones diverse ones thank you very much indeed zita um i'm informed that we have a question from the audience uh, which is apparently specifically for mona and it's from jill james uh, and, and i think perhaps this question will go to everyone else as well uh, mona mentioned social media uh, does this help us to stand up for our rights or does it get in the way which is a very interesting question uh, imagine for example if it had existed in nazi germany would resistance have been easier sorry to drop that on you mona anyone else can take it <laughs> no i i definitely think there are elements of i know like with with how do we how do we sense or who who senses their own word and 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 you know how many groups have then the power to have their own space but i think what what i specifically was drawing on was the comparison of how of a response either you can have smear campaigns or you can have the fact that i know specifically what i found very fascinating last summer was that with the blm movement and the hong kong protests was this very significant like they were sharing tactics on how to kind of protest peacefully and how to kind of protect themselves. So like putting a cone over over like um, sparks that are, are shed at you. And I think that that specifically was, was what I was drawing on with social media and with um, the fact that it can be used to then unionize and the fact that you then have a space to share resources and you have a space for collective movement. And I understand that yes, it's but I mean we we can have we have this dichotomy with social media, and I think that you know we can we can just hope that there is a space for resources and that that community engagement you know it's it still gives it that platform. So yes, there is another side to it, but there is also a side to the fact that to each to each their own, and the fact that we hope that it can be utilized for good, and that there is a space for utilized like it can. Give you that. I don't know if anyone else obviously has something else to 
to say. Feel free to jump in. I think social media is part of, you know, the times we live in and is a platform that we can use effectively. In fact, during the pandemic, because we couldn't go out to protest and marches, there were people were, but you know, we were limited and lots of people couldn't because of their own circumstances and because of safety. Um, actually, we used, we had to rely um, more, uh, you know, on um, the virtual world in order to mobilize and organize. And um, during this pandemic, I've been organizing against mass deportations by charter flight. And we would ordinarily have protests and marches, and we haven't been able to do that, but we have been able to mobilize and get people involved in those campaigns and take action by doing it online. Um, and I think if we want to appeal to a younger um, audience and bring the next generation up and engage them. I mean, somebody put in the chat, didn't they, about TikTok, using TikTok, then we have to use different, different methods of communication and ways of communication that engage a broad range of people. But we shouldn't forget that women, when we're online, face horrific misogyny. You know, I've faced death threats um, and all sorts of attacks online. And whether or not we're even campaigning on gender or equality or something completely different or something that benefits everybody, we find that we're targeted as women. And actually Glitch, which is challenging online abuse, was founded by a black woman in East London. So that's another, and that's a young black woman that founded that organization. That's another bit, bit of our you know, living, living history that um, we should be promoting and celebrating, but also provides important resources to challenge um, discrimination and abuse online. So we have to counter that. If we are going to be using social media, we need to make sure that we mobilize um, and support each other when we are under attack online too, and that we're able to use social media safely for everybody. Thank you very much indeed, Tita. Um, Halima or Laura, I don't know whether you ought to come in on that. Otherwise, we do have a final question coming through on the chat. I'll, I'll, I'll quickly come in on that. I think, um, yeah, I agree with everything that's been said about that. But also, um, I don't think we've got a choice anymore. You know, the whole social media thing has gone beyond our control now. It's very easy to pick out the bad parts of it because there are a lot. It is awful. It is a cesspit out there, especially Twitter. Um, but because of that, that is where a lot of working class people are getting their information um, because nobody's got time to sit and watch you know, documentaries about real life things. Nobody's got time to sit and read books. And so social media is is the place where people go. And if all they're hearing is, you know, far right rhetoric or, you know, um, anti everybody but, them, but, you know, white middle class men, then then it's incumbent on us to, to offer an alternative, um, which is difficult because the mainstream media um, has its own narrative. Um, that is probably a conversation that I will save for another panel. <laughs> but, you know, we, we, we do need to offer an alternative. We do need to fight against that. And we do need to offer something that is, you know, truthful, um, that is offering a voice and amplifying the voices of working class people, of marginalised people, um, and offering, you know, as much diversity as possible. Because our mainstream media aren't giving us that. Um, so we need to and it's a big job <laughs> don't get me wrong it is massive but the only alternative we've got to that is let them go with it um, and that's just not an option. I'll come in really quickly on, on that um, George Floyd's murder um, filmed and broadcast and circulated uh, everywhere across the world I mean Lots of black and minority people say, well, that's not the first time we've seen some violence of that kind. And we've seen the various videos, but that combination of being locked in your homes because of COVID and for that to then go viral changed something. Now it didn't change my mind or Zita's mind or maybe Laura's and Ed's here because maybe, maybe we're quite um, alert to racial injustice, 
But certainly there was a middle ground of people who felt that racism was something that happened in very bad places where people wear these strange hats and it's nothing to do with their lives. But the fact that they saw that played real time for eight minutes and four seconds, I mean, that, that showed you the power of social media to do something important. Now, obviously there's something else behind that and there's a backlash that you then have to deal with. But social media and that medium and TikTok is what we've got now. So people don't go to Panorama, they go to TikTok. Even the BBC is having to work with social media and everybody's gone digital. So I think in some ways it's a redundant question. We're in it, we're living it, deal with it, uh, survive it. Uh, like Sita was saying, I mean, the stuff that we have to deal with as women and women of colour, I could write a book about that. How However, this is where we are, and this is where the, the ideas are being won at the moment. And Laura, to your point about um, working class people use um, social media a lot, I, I agree, because there's something about um, time. Time is precious for working class communities. They just don't have all that time to sit about and write 10 books on their lifetime's careers biography. They've got to get on with the job of earning a living and then be able to communicate. So I think for working class communities and marginalized communities, social media is that platform. Now that comes with a lot of risks and dangers. We need to deal with that. And government has a role to play in actually regulating that space a little bit, but can't get away from it. Can't change it, beat them at their own game if there are others that are working um, on a different agenda with it. Wonderful. Well, thank you very much indeed, Halima, for what uh, I think will be uh, the last comment in response to the questions. I think that's all we have time for. So thank you very much again, um, firstly to the organisers for organising this wonderful event, but especially to our panellists today, uh, Dr Halima Begum. Laura Daly, Zita Holborn, and Mona Mathari. Uh, so please do put your hands together for our speakers, although they might not be able to hear it, I'm afraid. <laughs> Thanks very much, guys. Well, thank you very, very much, everybody. I mean, it's, it's been an in, interesting evening, um, far, far more interesting than I even imagined. It's just been brilliant to see so many people join us and um, really a heartfelt thanks to everyone who's taken part in the event tonight, to all our wonderful guests, speakers and readers, and to all of, the, all of you that chose to share your evening with us on this uh, Tuesday evening. Also thanks to QMUL for supporting us at this event. And last but not least, thank you to the terrific team I have around me who helped me put this um, event together tonight, which is uh, Anna Somner, Graham Johnson, Polly Creed, Anna Robinson and Nicola Rushton. So thanks everybody so much. Please do get in touch via our website, which we'll put in the link again now, um, if you're interested to hear more about our work or if you want to get involved. And also just to remind you that Feathers and Pennies is also available to buy on our website. I do hope you all enjoyed the event tonight and I hope to see you all again at some point soon. So thank you all very, very much and good night. Thank you, Sam.